Hi, my name is Josh Mahoney, Chief Market Analyst at Scope Markets. We've got the FOMC meeting coming up this week on the 31st of July, and we're seeing out the month in somewhat interesting style. I mean, ultimately, it looks like the FOMC are essentially going to pass the buck, kick the can and move on to September. And that's where everyone's really looking for potential action from the FOMC. So is this meeting important? Is it the kind of thing that we're going to see significant volatility around? Or is it just something that's going to be somewhat of a damp squib as we all just bide our time and wait for September? Well, I'll take you through a few different charts and highlight exactly why uh, this could be an interesting uh, announcement and also what exactly might need to happen for us to uh, see significant volatility. What are markets currently expecting? What would be a change from that? Uh, so let's get into it. There's a whole host of different charts that I've got for you guys here. First and foremost, this is the outlook in terms of US inflation. We've got CPI, core CPI and core PCE. Of course, the core PCE number is the, the figure that argues the case for a rate cut from the Federal Reserve uh, more ardently than the likes of the CPI. And you can see that's because it's significantly lower in the purple line. The core CPI, uh, core PCE metric uh, falling back once again of late and this gradual drift towards the downside takes us closer and closer towards our 2% target. And bear in mind that the Federal Reserve aren't going to act when they hit 2%. They're going to act when they see a pathway to 2%, right? So we need to know that we're going to hit 2% in a few months time, for example, for them to start to take action. So we can try to uh, figure out when exactly that might happen. So first and foremost, you can look in the middle of this chart, in the, in, in the middle uh, section on the right, these blue bars, you can see the January, February, March, April, all of them very strong levels of inflation above target so you can see this target rate which is roughly 1.66 recurring uh, and anything below that would end up at the end of the year uh, if you keep seeing that figure you would end up below the two percent target above that level and you'd end up above two percent so what do we want to see we want to see disinflation coming in the form of monthly metrics below that one zero point one six six well, that's exactly what we've seen over the past two months. And that's why markets are feeling a lot more optimistic that we will see rate cut in September. We will see potentially three rate cuts this year. And that's all come because of these last two inflation metrics uh, in terms of the CPI. But also we've seen downside in terms of the PCE figure as well. So if we're talking about that pathway to 2%, how does that play out? So if you look here, first and foremost, Inflation, roughly around 3%. So where are we going to see that disinflation happen? Well, the next figure that's going to be coming out is July, and that's 0 0.206. So we could see a bit of disinflation. Maybe it takes us down to 2.9, 2.8, something like that. Still a bit away from that 2% target. Then we see that 0 0.512 stripped out from August of last year. That could get us into the mid twos. And then September, 0 0.36. That could get us into the low to mid two. So we could get maybe at 2.4, something like that. 2.4, 2.5 by September. Now, of course, we're expecting a potential rate cut in September. Um, and so you're looking beyond that to say, okay, is there a justification at September with inflation in the mid twos to say, well, we're on a pathway to 2%. Well, over the coming months beyond that, you can see October, we have a very low figure in terms of monthly inflation. That figure is, you know, probably going to see inflation rise. Maybe we got to 2.6, maybe at 2.4, we go to 2.5. But if you look beyond that, we see those monthly figures ramping up. And certainly at the beginning of this year, and therefore the beginning of next year, that's when we're seeing uh, significant shifts in terms of inflation. The, the hefty inflation metrics we've seen in Q1 in particular of 2024, when they're stripped out, that's going to provide a massive tailwind, tailwind for disinflation that will likely see us below that 2% target. And so the Federal Reserve can essentially say, we're going to be mid twos in September. And that's when they make their decision. But they can say, okay, well, by the end of the first quarter of 2025, uh, so by that point, it's going to be maybe six months down the line, they're going to say, pretty confidently that we'll be heading well below that 2% target. So there is a justification for a rate cut in September. Um, and that is on the headline basis. 
Let me just show you it in terms of some other metrics. This is the core figure that we have. I mean, this is a whole different, a bunch of different things, right? So this, the core figure is the orangey yellow line, 3.27 on a very nice downward trajectory. If you strip out shelter, remember a shelter is a, roughly a third of inflation, you can see that core without shelter, we're already below that 2% target. So shelter is clearly a big issue. And there's a significant tailwind for disinflation coming from shelter as well. It's very lagging in the way that it is, it is uh, uh, calculated with the owner-operated rents. Um, but as we can see here, 5.16, but we're seeing this strong down move in terms of shelter. And we're also now starting to see the services excluding shelter start to top out as well, uh, which are the two top lines here. So we're seeing a tailwind in terms of disinflation that should also help things in terms of the core side of things. Energy is going to be a key part of this. And part of why we're feeling quite confident at the moment in terms of inflation is, yes, we did see a pickup in terms of inflation, which could point towards the next monthly metric uh, moving towards the upside. You can see that green line, the one month CPI change. That, I think, is likely to move towards the upside of the next figure as we see that rebound in oil uh, taking shape and, and, and playing a role. But we've also seen that rebound in oil already fade. So any upside in terms of CPI on a monthly basis, I think will be short term in, in nature and will probably come back down once again afterwards. In terms of wages, we can see here that that uh, those blue bars at the bottom highlighting the three-month trend, essentially, the three-month annualized figure. That's back down into the gray band, which essentially is the sort of pre-pandemic level. So wages, I would say, sort of roughly on track to be where they are normally. You know, it's not to say uh, that wages have to be at 2% because it's not a 2% target for wages. Um, and you can see here with the blue line at the top, the light blue line, uh, we can see it's roughly, a, you know, somewhere between three and four. Well, we're at 3.86 at the moment. Um, you can see here the month on month wage figure um, over the last few months. It's been a little bit choppy, but we are seeing a downtrend in terms of wage uh, growth and we're seeing a downtrend in terms of that core CPI. So from an inflation perspective, there's an argument to say uh, that they could ease in September. Now, in terms of what's driving it, this is really interesting. This has come from uh, Financial Times, but they've obviously taken it from uh, somewhere else. So you can see exactly what's driving inflation and how that's shifted, right? So where it was previously demand-driven, we're now seeing inflation being progressively supply-driven. Supply-driven side of things is less influenced by the Federal Reserve. Demand side, where they're essentially raising inflation, uh, raising interest rates and trying to drive down demand, that's less important now. So arguably, the reasoning for them to keep rates high uh, is less justified from a disinflationary standpoint. This follows on from that. So you can see the most responsive um, components. So the things that are most responsive to uh, the likes of interest rates and the like, you can see that has declined. And the least responsive components are what's left over in terms of inflation. So arguably, and you can see there's a clear downtrend in terms of that, arguably, it's now just a waiting game, really. The most responsive elements have already been driven down from an inflation perspective, and therefore the least responsive ones uh, are already on a downward trajectory. So you could essentially cut interest rates, and the fact that they're least responsive means you probably won't see a massive uptick in terms of those elements that you're trying to drive down currently. So again, that would argue that the Federal Reserve could cut interest rates soon. When are they going to cut interest rates? Well, like I said, it's September, the markets are pricing, the current uh, expectations point towards just a 4% chance that we see a 25 basis point cut from the Fed in uh, next, well, on the 31st of July, essentially, as we close out the month. But markets feeling a lot more confident going forward. So you can see here, there's a massive jump where September markets are pricing essentially a 0% chance that we are where we are. So markets are very confident that we're going to cut interest rates and potentially by 20 basis points, uh, sorry, 20, by two uh, cuts, essentially 50 basis points, that's a 10% outside chance. And we look beyond that, we look towards the end of the year, you're looking at December and we're seeing 59% chance that we're at four and a half to 4.75 and even a 6.5% chance that we're 100 basis points lower than where we are currently, right? So markets potentially getting a bit carried away with themselves. There's a justification for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates. 
Um, but are they going to cut interest rates in such a dramatic fashion? Um, it looks very unlikely we're going to see an interest rate cut this time around. But maybe this is a case of saying that the Federal Reserve are either going to come out with something really dovish or they're going to come out with something that's going to try to temper expectations. Because as it stands, you've essentially got three meetings for the rest of the year beyond this coming meeting, right? You've got September, November, December. Markets are essentially saying September's a foregone conclusion. Then they're saying for November, you've got a 71% chance that you would see another rate cut. And then by December, you, they're saying that you've got a 65% chance. So essentially by year end, 65% chance that we see a rate cut at every single meeting beyond this current one. You know, that is a concern because markets are essentially pricing in perfection right now, right? What what would you need to see to point for towards greater optimism on that side? You know, it's difficult, you know, beyond what they're expecting right now. There's not much more you can. And it does make me cast my mind back to the beginning of the year when everyone said seven rate cuts for this year. And what's happened? Well, now we've reversed back and people are now thinking we're going to see three rate cuts. It had gone down to one or two. Um, but certainly, you know, we just saw them, the Federal Reserve continuously pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. In terms of um, the S&P 500, first and foremost, if we're looking at sort of market expectations. Firstly, this relationship between the change in the S&P 500 and the ISM services PMI, I find really interesting. And I wanted to bring this to your attention because what we've seen recently is this move towards the downside, downside in terms of the ISM figure. And it's moved back below that 50 threshold. But we're seeing this divergence between the performance of the S&P 500 and that ISM services PMI, in part because markets are now in a firmly in a bad news is good news perspective when it comes to something like this, the services sector, which is very much heavily linked to um, the likes of inflation because it's essentially being services dri driven right now. Um, so what are we looking for? We're looking for potential weakness in terms of we've got the jobs report, the jobs report coming up. And given the divergence we're seeing at the moment, any weakness we're seeing would, again, make people feel more confident about the possibility of um, us seeing interest rate cuts going forward. Now, in terms of the 10-year yield, so the 10-year yield is one proxy for essentially measuring people's perception of where rates are going to go. You can see the 10-year has been declining alongside this Citigroup Economic Surprise Index. So as we're seeing weakness in terms of economic data coming out of the US, that is also driving down the US 10-year yield, which highlights uh, that people think that a weak economic outlook should provide us with lower interest rates from the Federal Reserve. So the further we see weakness in terms of the economy, the more people think we're going to see rate cuts, the more optimistic people are within stock markets, the more we're likely to see inverse moves for the US dollar. The final chart I want to show you before we actually get into uh, looking at the likes of the US dollar and some of the stocks is this chart, which I think is really interesting. So first and foremost, the top end, I mean, I've got it on both, right? It's the light blue and the purple. I probably should have colored them the same, but we've got the market expectations for where interest rates are going to be. So the implied rates associated with the December meeting of 2024. So as time has gone on, where do people think rates are going to be? And you can see we've had this period, right? At the beginning of the year, there was all this talk of seven rate cuts, right? And then gradually that just got pushed out and pushed out and pushed out and it kept rising, rising, rising. And then we had this inflection point in late May where we've now been seeing this purple line or this blue line, it's the same thing, moving towards the downside. Suddenly now everyone's starting to feel more confident. And this tallies up with, let me go all the way back here. There we go. So this tallies up with this, right? In the middle on the right, we've got these two bars of inflation, which are basically negative inflation, flat inflation. So we've come off the beginning of the year, we saw massive inflation on a monthly basis. And as soon as we start seeing it dropping out, and we're seeing these like negative or flat inflation metrics, all of a sudden, you get there, we, there we go, you start to see 
those expectations moving towards the downside in a heavy manner. What does that do in terms of the impact to markets? You can see a close correlation with that 10 year yield. So as I said, we we have that expectation that if you're, you're looking for how people were feeling about uh, it, potential interest rate cuts, look at the US 10 year yield. It moves in tandem. By and large, if we're seeing downside in terms of yields, people are feeling more confident we're going to see rate cuts from the Federal Reserve. And you can see at the bottom, we also have a, that correlation between the 10-year yield and the US dollar index. So that means if we see something that comes out of this FOMC meeting, be it a rate cut at this meeting, or be it something that they say, yep, we are pr pretty much going to be cutting rates at every meeting from here on in, which they wouldn't say that. Uh, but something that people deem to be very dovish that might shift things from being 65 percent chance that we see three three rate cuts this year to 75, 80 percent. If we see comments to that effect or actions to that effect, what would we see? We'd see further downside for this purple line, the blue line, as people's expectations for where rates would be by year end shift towards the downside. And we'd likely see downside for the US 10 year yield and downside for the US dollar. The flip side of that, of course, is there's high expectations for what the Federal Reserve is going to be doing. And therefore, if they come out and say, well, you know, I don't want people to get too carried away. Potentially, we're going to see a rate cut in the coming meetings will be data dependent. We have seen the odd thing, but, you know, we're not we're not too desperate to to ease in a drastic manner at the moment. Maybe people start to rein in some of those expectations, in which case you see upside in terms of all of these lines, most notably the US dollar, of course. Um, but, you know, if you're seeing the way things are at the moment, they're skewed so heavily towards uh, a lot of rate cuts this year. You know, every single meeting seemingly just priced in for a rate cut for the back end of this year. It does make me think a little bit like about how things were at the beginning of the year and that markets were just getting a bit crazy. And it seems like markets just swing from one side to another. One minute they think they're going to get five rate cuts this year and, and the Federal Reserve are f factoring in about two or three less than that. Then all of a sudden they've swung, you know, by the middle of the year, swung to the opposite direction. The Federal Reserve are saying they're going to do three and markets are kind of start pricing in two going on towards one. And then you see it swing the opposite direction. And now markets are saying, OK, well, there's beyond July, which they don't think is live. They think they're going to see three rate cuts in three meetings. So, you know, these shifts uh, invariably have an impact on the US dollar in particular. And so if we do see a swing in the direction of potentially easing off those expectations, you could see a pickup in terms of, of the US dollar. So let's get into it in terms of the charts. Here we go. This is the US dollar against the Swiss franc. This is an interesting one because, of course, both of them are perceived to be havens. Uh, so it's stripping out some of that risk on risk off kind of thing, right? Playing it a little bit more alongside expectations for rates. And so I've overlaid it with the US 10 year yield. And you can see here really great correlation here between the US dollar, you know, dollar Swissy essentially, and the US 10 year yield. And so essentially, it highlights that if you think that this meeting is going to make markets ease off those expectations and start thinking that maybe we only see two rate cuts this year, something like that, then you're likely to see the 10 year yield moving towards the upside and likely to see dollar Swissy moving towards the upside. And notably, we have got on the top end of this a very clear trend in play, right? So we can see that we've got this sort of descending trend line in play here. We've got your first horizontal resistance or swing high at 0 0.892. So if we break up through that level and through this descending trend line, then it looks like we could have a bit of a bullish surge from here. But until that happens, the bears have been in charge for a bit now. We've got expectations of the Federal Reserve cutting in September and cutting three times this year have just continued to grow and grow and grow. If we see more of the same, then this rally looks like it could come into a sort of Fibonacci area alongside that descending trend line. So just come through to 61.8. So the 76.4 is 0 0.889. So the downtrend still does remain intact, intact until we see 0 0.892 taken out. So look out for this Fibonacci level alongside that descending trend line uh, for the bears to potentially turn things around. Also, I wanted to bring up the Russell 2000. Um, it's an interesting one right now because essentially we're seeing big question marks around the tech sector in particular. 
And as we move towards an interest rate cut from the Federal Reserve, people are thinking, OK, who's going to benefit from this the most? In the past, when you've seen loose monetary policy and in particular quantitative easing, it has benefited those big stocks because all of a sudden there's huge liquidity. There's a lot of money sloshing around. Where are you going to put your money? Stick it all in those big growth names, right? And you don't necessarily see all of that money flooding into you know your small caps or also 2000s. But in this situation, we've been through a period of elevated interest rates that has essentially uh, put a lot of pressure uh, and concern uh, on or around the small cap stocks because a lot of them are reliant on borrowing and the, the cost of borrowing has gone up. A lot of them are not profitable quite yet. And therefore, we've been seeing this big outperformance of late. And so whilst if I if I was to overlay the likes of the SPX, so the S&P 500, you can see here we go. This is what it's looked like of late, right? So you're seeing three, three and a half percent decline here. And you're seeing the Russell 2000, you know, let's say when we're down here, SPX essentially flat over that period, 11% gain for the Russell 2000, different ways you want to cut it up. But essentially, we've seen this outperformance of late. And the Russell 2000 is a clear benefactor from a move into looser monetary policy. And in particular, significant rate cuts because it cuts the the cost of borrowing so if we see dovish comments if we see them coming out and emboldening those calls for rate cuts look for further upside for the russell 2000 but if we do see them start to rein things in somewhat then this massive rebound that we've seen of late starts to come into question in particular if we break below that 2195 because as it stands you can see the sort of stepped move higher up into these higher lows the near term swing low is two, 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 two. Uh, but once we start breaking through swing lows, that's when the questions are being asked. But until then, you can see the, the pop, the pullback. And now we're creating these higher highs, higher lows, uh, looking towards potentially breaking through that resistance of two, two, eight, zero once again. But a lot of it comes down to those expectations for uh, action from the Federal Reserve. As it stands, people feeling very confident that we will see uh, a raft of interest rate cuts from the Federal Reserve pushing towards the back end of the year and into next year uh, as we see them slashing the cost of borrowing in a heavy manner, which should benefit the likes of the Russell 2000. It should benefit uh, the likes of US stocks as a whole, but it should come to the detriment of the US dollar. The question mark here is whether this Fed meeting is going to do enough to continue to push a narrative that has been building so much of late and has got to a little bit of a ridiculous position where essentially a rate cut at every meeting beyond this week is near enough priced in. That might be a little bit concerning just how far markets have gone uh, for the time being. That being said, like I said, the recent disinflation has been welcome and there is a clear pathway back down to 2%, certainly towards the back end of Q1 in 2025.